So I did this interview, and they had asked me, um, you know, it's always, that, it's always that question of, I mean, obviously, uh, people want you to dig deep, and they want to know how you got started in the art world. But, and I, I, can, I can honestly say that there was, like, three things that really, really, really heavily influenced me to, to become an artist. One of them um, was when I was younger. My father was a salsa musician, but um, my father, and I actually still have a table here in my studio that he built, um, and he's still alive. But in the 70s, he used to make these tables, but my dad had, like, the craziest, most beautiful writing that you've ever seen. He had really good penmanship. I mean, but it was really just like, it was... It was almost like nonstop writing. And for some reason, I was really heavily influenced by that. There was something that was really delicate and very beautiful that I got, that I got completely attracted to. And I was completely just, like, obsessed with it. And I don't know. And even to this day, I'm, I'm, I still love his writing. There's something about it. It's really beautiful. The second thing was uh, Charlie Brown and the Peanut Specials were really important to me. Because um, that's, like, I actually, like, learned... I actually got, I actually um, found jazz music for the first time. Um, <clears throat> I found uh, uh, how to kind of react on a very social level for the first time when I was growing up, just kind of seeing how people interacted. And I just thought, you know, it, it just, it was a really good life lesson. And then also just the animation behind it. Um, and I got to tell you, when Charles Schultz died, he, he said something that literally, like, I completely teared up. And they had an interview, and they they had asked him like, "What was like the one regret that you have in like in your in your career?" And he said that Charlie Brown never got not to, he never got to kick that football. And I was like, "Oh my God, it's so heartbreaking." I'm like, "God, I just tore my heart apart." And the third thing was is actually Jeff, and Jeff was the first artist that I had ever met, and he's a and he's a great artist today, like living in Chicago, full time artist making his work. Um, I've known Jeff since third grade. So I've known Jeff since we're maybe like seven, at least seven or eight years old. How much younger is he than you? He's not. I'm 40. Are you 40? 41. Oh! <laughs> so Jeff is, Jeff was the first, Jeff was the first artist that I've met. And Jeff and I actually, um, Collected comic books when we were younger. We uh, we spent nights, we spent the evenings at each other's houses. He lived a block away from me, but I'll never forget. He had this amazing, amazing ability to capture. So, and the point that I'm making is that Jeff is actually a much better artist than I am. There's there's something that he can capture within his work that I can't, um, and he can go back and forth from doing like abstract work to you know to realist work and. You know, I have, like, one very specific kind of, like, language and idea. Um, so that, that was actually a huge influence on me. And I, can, and I can tell you that he signed my eighth grade um, book, and I can tell you exactly what he did, what he wrote in there. He wrote, uh, he actually had a, a drawing of me, like, with my hands out chasing girls in high school. <laughs> it was like it was like this really like, creepy image of me just, like, with my hands out, like, trying to grab some girl running away from me. Like saying like half fun in high school or something, but I, I clearly remember that, and I just and I remember all of his drawings and all of his work, and it was really inspiring. Um, but you know, because I knew you guys were going to come here today, and I thought it was important for you know for Jeff to be here because that was like a really heavy inspiration in my work as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're welcome, man. Definitely, you should definitely look. Jeff's last name on here? Did you say Maldonado? Maldonado, yeah. M A L D O N A D O. Just in case you don't. The jail tells not kicking in. I'm just um, so let's go uh, next door, and I'm gonna show you uh, the kind of process what we're doing. Okay, Victoria. <laughs> hi, hi, Captain. I got you on that one. Uh, so this is actually a piece that I actually kept for myself. This is a, a bicycle, um, a bicycle sculpture that's heavily influenced off of lowrider culture. Um, and this piece, I actually, this piece, I, I, I knew when I made, when I made it, this is a piece I wanted to be a work in progress and I wanted to, to keep this bicycle and I wanted to ride it and I wanted to keep it. I actually wanted it to be used. A lot of the bicycles that I make, um, are usually, they're actually usually bought right away from either institutions or collectors, but 
this is something that I kept because I really wanted to I really wanted to like make it known that these are vehicles and and that they serve several purposes, you know, not only as sculptures, but they, you know, they also work and they function. Um, there's something, you know, you know, there's something like really raw and aggressive about like, there's something really aggressive about having this kind of, you know, you can, you can have it either way. You can have this very aggressive music on it and, the, you know, on top of this very delicate looking bicycle, or you can have, you know, very beautiful music that is on a bicycle that looks like a floating sculpture. It just has so many different dynamics to it. Um, and this is actually one of the few bicycles, sculptures that I have that have store-bought products on them. Most of the time they're all, most of them are handmade and they're hand cut and hand embellished and engraved. Um, one of the things that really inspires me about custom culture and there's there's a few things you know when you think of custom culture you think of you know you think of uh, Latino or you think of African American which is a total stereotype because that whole movement was heavily influenced by the Rat Rod movement which was from like the late fifties which was almost an all white you know it was almost like an this all white club of people that made these hot rods. And they race these rat rods, you know, kind of greaser-ish, 50s, 60s. You know, so this whole dynamic of, like, making these pieces that are kind of D, uh, uh, DYI kind of actually started from that whole thing. So when I see, lo when I see customs, when I see lowriders, I see beyond lowriders. I see custom culture work. But also one of the reasons that I started working in this, in this vein is because the, for me there was a few things. One of them was the people who made these works completely reminded me of why I'm an artist and remind me of why I make work. They, a lot of them have job, a lot of them have full-time jobs. A lot of them have kids. They have families. They don't make any money selling this at all. I mean, but they put, a, they put their heart and soul into this thing. Sometimes you'll see a car that's been, that's been made and then you'll, the bottom of the whole bottom of the car is 24 karat gold and it's completely hand engraved, but it's something that you don't even see. The public doesn't even see it. And that alone reminds me of why I come into the studio every day and why I make work is because it's those hidden gems that people don't know and realize that's there that you just walk by every single day. And so I also like to question the idea of stereotyping. And I also kind of question this idea of there's a remote hint of this racist kind of, you know, overtone and undertone that, that these works have because, you know, when, when somebody walks into a museum or a gallery and they see these works, right away they think black Latino. They think uh, lowrider culture. They think street culture. But what they fail to realize is that even the people who I work, my fabricators, are almost all white. So... Right away, there is just there's a break. There's a right, right. For me personally, there is. I'm, I'm, I'm posing a question to people about stereotyping and why this should or shouldn't belong into a museum or why it shouldn't belong in an institution. I mean, does the value of this bicycle go up because I made it and because I signed it? And why isn't the value of this bicycle the same when someone, maybe he is Latino, living in Minneapolis, made it? Like, why isn't that value and that status the same. <clears throat> One of the other things that I've been doing is, um, you know, so now the work kind of starts uh, entertaining the idea and questioning identity and, uh, and culture, which is really important to me. Because, you know, a lot of these car clubs have these little plaques. They're called, uh, they're, they're just, they're just car, car plaques. And they're maybe like 12 by 12 inches. And a lot recently what I've been doing is I've been taking these car plaques and I've been blowing them up like a thousand times their size. Uh, like one of them is uh, called Loyalty Car Club. And, but when you take that word loyalty and you make it, you know, eight foot by like, you know, four foot, and you coat it in gold plating and you put it in a museum setting, it completely takes the context of what it originally was meant for and it, you, you put it somewhere else. And it's safe. And it becomes safe, and people feel safe around it. 
But if they were to see where I actually got the inspiration from, you know, from this car on the west side of Chicago, you know, it's kind of off limits. You know, there's this weird thing of like, no, like, you know, I don't associate with that. You know, that's kind of like not my thing. But when you see that same thing out of context put into the MCA, it becomes this whole organic process where it's accepted, it's okay, it feels valid, it feels safe. And that's another question that I ask is that, you know, why isn't it valid when it's on the west side of Chicago? Well, why is it valid at the MCA? Um, another thing that I do is I take um, – I've been documenting a lot of my fabricators, and I've been documenting their tattoos. So I've been taking the the text of their tattoos. Like one guy who I know has this ever this this tattoo says everlasting, and I don't know if you see my website, but I have a few pieces that are done in crystals. This is it says everlasting, and it's an absolutely stunning, beautiful piece. But that piece originated from somebody's back, and there, it was a tattoo that was from their back. So can I just finish first, please? So the thing is, is that my my thing is that, you know, it's it's funny because the person who I documented that tattoo from, if you saw that person from a half a block away, you know, there's this weird thing, especially if they're a minority. You're just kind of like, mm, don't really associate my, you know, myself with them. But believe it or not, that person is actually, and the people who I work with are some of the sweetest, sweetest, most humblest people I've ever worked with. Super sweet. But what's awesome is that when you go to the museum and that tattoo that I that that influenced that work, that same person is walking around that museum, you're a little bit standoffish, even if you saw that tattoo in public, but it looks completely different in crystals, in a setting, covered in gold leaf, in a museum setting. Because again, there's this there's this there's this idea that something feels safe. And those are the things that, you know, so I actually love the idea that I can embrace this community and the community has embraced me. I also like the fact that the work has become relevant where it's asking questions. Um, so, you know, and don't get me wrong, you know, I love, the most important thing is I love making beautiful work. Uh, my work is really over the top. You know, I use crystals, I use, I use real, you know, 23 karat gold leaf and hand engraving. And I, you know, and I spend hours and hours on this stuff and, you know, days and months, but, you know, I love the fact that I can make a work that can be completely relevant. And I also like making work, uh, that can be beautiful, that can have, that can basically attract the viewer. But once the viewer starts looking at the work, they can start questioning, like, why is this work, posed next to this other piece, or why is this piece, you know, in this setting? Um, another good example is uh, putting these kind of almost uh, spiritual kind of Buddhist influence paintings in front of these very aggressive bicycles and boats and cars that I make. Yeah. Um, so the thing that's important for me, though, is just that I like this idea of kind of this, you know, this kind of good versus evil or this, you know, oil and water. You're kind of mixing these two cultures that don't belong together. And I think that, for me, is taking a risk in the work, which is important to me. But uh, Connie had a question. Well, I was just wondering, um, when you're showing your work at the museums and different projects and stuff, do you actually show this source material, like juxtapose this uh... um, Sometimes I do. I mean, recently, I mean, I'm doing a big project right now that is based on nail culture. And so I'm doing... Uh, you mean Yeah. Um, so right now, I mean, I've been doing, I've been researching this project for almost like six months now, or six months to a year. And so what I'm doing is we're actually producing a publication on it too. So the publication is going to show the source material and the end result. And it goes, you know, it goes heavily from, you know, these kind of like, you know, some people will call it ghettoized nails to, um, very flamboyant art pieces that are done in Japan. And so the show my, and, the, and my new work and the show, the, the concept of the show is really heavily influenced and based on this nail culture that I'm, that I'm working on. It would be cool if you could do the same kind of thing with the, the bike culture, the custom culture, too, in your bike. Uh, believe it or not, some of these pe you know, some of the people, and I have to respect their privacy, some of them don't even like to, to be out in the public. I mean, they just, you know, and that's why I respect them. They love making the work and they love being behind the scenes. So 
you know, for, for years I, I had my studio set up. And the studio, the studio, you know, I really believe in, again, like setting up this kind of a certain energy in the studio. And the, the studio wasn't working for me when I first moved in here. And I had to make the studio work. I had to actually create it and make it work for me so that it had a certain flow. So, you know, we have, we have a, a full wood, uh, wood, wood shop. Um, and then if you guys want to just take a quick look over here. Then I have a I have a full spray room here. So, and if you you know you guys can walk in here and look at I me, mean, you can see that everything is everything is organized, everything is labeled. Uh, uh, this is for hanging when we hang uh, certain sculptural pieces. Uh, so this is. You know, again, so it's really important to me that my studio is working for me as an artist, and I'm not working for the studio. I mean, you have to have some fluidity. And, you know, as you can see that, you know, I really believe in maintaining a very clean practice. I mean, it's kind of common sense. If something's labeled and it's put back away somewhere, you're going to find it the next day. And that's, the, and that's how I like to set up my studio. So I know where everything is, and it's really important that you know where everything is. Um, but, you know, again, this room is set up strictly for spraying. We don't do anything else in here. And I think that you have to kind of maintain that, that space and that privacy for the work. I mean, I think you need to, if you're going to bring it in here, it's got to have its own life, and it's got to have its, you know, it's got to breathe on its own, and then you've got to take it back out into that room. And if you walk back out here... You know, this is the area that we kind of do. Uh, and recently, I've been recently I've been really obsessed with um, recently I've been really obsessed with uh, craft-based work because I've been so influenced by the bicycle sculptures and the and the the the, the boat and the car sculptures. So I've been really heavily influenced about this idea of mixing of mixing my language and. I like the idea on how on how the contemporary aesthetic, on how my contemporary aesthetic can work with this Baroque language. Yeah, I mean, I got invited to do the Venice Biennial, and and what I did with the Venice Biennial was it was the same idea. I knew, you know, obviously it's in Venice, Italy, but for me, what was really important was um, I I did this project where it was uh, it was discussing. Again, identity, and it was discussing uh, discussing the diaspora, and so he he actually organized the Ukrainian Pavilion, and what P Victor Pinchuk is one of the wealthiest collectors in Europe, and he's like labeled as like one of the top like 100 power people in in the art business. He um, he had asked sorry he had asked he had asked Peter if he had asked Peter. Peter Dorshenko, sorry. He had asked Peter Dorshenko if what they wanted to do is they wanted to create this language between contemporary Ukrainian artists and an international art scene. And they wanted these artists to kind of work in some format where there would be a story that would be told. So uh, what, Vi what Peter Dorshenko and Viktor Pinchuk did is they asked, I think, a dozen artists to submit proposals to work with these uh, Russian and Ukrainian artists. For the Venice by for the Venice Biennale for the Pavilion, um, I got selected along with uh, Mark Chichner, who was up for the Turner Prize in London, uh, Sam Taylor Wood, who's a widely recognized video artist and artist in her own right, uh, based in the UK. Um, there's a handful of people. I mean, you know, Jurgen Teller, who's a very well-known fashion photographer. Uh, uh, two years ago, yeah. Um, so. What I decided to do was I decided to I went I did some site visits to the Ukraine and I had realized that old and new Kiev was separated by this by this this river and so what I decided to do was to make a lowrider boat. I had done some research to see if there's if you know if one had ever been made before there you know there, no one has never been made. So then I thought you know, I want to have this boat as a platform to kind of tell these stories. So then I did this video piece where I just traveled all over the Ukraine. I had people travel with, with me to the Ukraine. And we just interviewed people, asking them what, 
what it was like to be Ukrainian. And Chicago has the, one of the largest Ukrainian um, diasporas outside of, uh, outside of the Ukraine. So I did this story that what kind of went back and forth. And I, it, I could relate to it because being Puerto Rican, there was this thing of I felt it felt the same way to me because talking to my parents, you know, they were always going back. There's always this thing of like the island going back and forth from the island to Chicago. And so I basically related that story to these people that lived in the Ukraine who actually had family in Chicago. Um, so I did the video piece on the boat. But the best part, though, was that I made the boat at the back of Pasadita, which is a famous uh, taco restaurant here in Chicago. So the boat that was in the Venice Biennial was like made literally in the garage of Pasadita, which is awesome. Like for me, like for me that for me, aside from the boat, aside from being in the Venice Biennale, aside from working with these amazing people that I met in the Ukraine and Chicago, just the idea that something that something that normally there's something that was made in someone's garage that had this very kind of DIY um, and a li- something that just had this kind of custom feel to it that normally would be made for and be presented on the street was actually prepared for the Venice Biennale. Like, that, for me, that was just as important. How was it shown? Uh, we had it. On, we actually had it on the water, and we had it running, and I just like. And for me, I just really wanted to kind of just push it. So I actually had a DJ. I flew in a DJ from the Ukraine, and he played um, basically the history of, of music from the Ukraine, from early folk music to, like, techno that they were, that they were producing now. And then we – and I had – there was a full-on DJ. There was a smoke machine, turntables, and we just – I completely put it on. I blasted, like, on 11. And then finally, the police came and shut it down. And um, but you know that was just part of the idea. It was part of the process. Yeah, yeah. But it was great though. Like even but people like people like even in the gondolas like were stopping and taking pictures. And you know, so for me, you know, even if it wasn't the Biennale, the idea that you can you can actually move someone to stop and take a picture and you can cross boundaries. And the one thing that I'm really, the one thing that I'm super proud of with my work is that, is that I really feel that my work can, can, can cross cultural and racial and age boundaries. And I'm really proud of that. And and I'm really happy that I'm able to bring so many people in from different communities to actually, you know, see and appreciate the work and talk about it and take pictures. And like, and that's really, really important for me. And I think that should be important to to you as artists as well, that you want to connect these kind of people together. You want people to kind of discuss the work. And again, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that, you know, there aren't, that are not fans of my work, and there are people that are fans of my work. And that's just the whole idea. I mean, people talk about it. That's the reason you make art. Um, and I, I have these up right now, and the 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 work that i'm doing right now is really heavily based on producing sculptures and paintings that are created in a very unorthodox manner uh like that painting almost from beginning to end was created in an auto body shop the round one yeah uh what do you mean it's on canvas or is it metal no it's on wood Uh, it's just, it's, uh, it's a technique that I developed and we just kind of, we did a bunch, you know, it's, I mean, I didn't just like cut a piece of round wood out and take it to them and say, okay, paint it. I mean, this stuff takes, I mean, you know, this was, this was months in the making. I mean, I did four studies maybe before we actually got it right. Because you have to, you have to also understand that, you know, weather constricts things. You're working with a new kind of uh, material. <clears throat> and that's the one thing that I also suggest as well is that, you know, you have to work with materials. I mean, I've worked with resin that is completely yellowing on me now that, you know, I would never work with again. There are certain things that, you know, they have to hold the test of time. And, you know, but, uh, but aside from this, I'm also really, really interested in this language that Ed Ruscha and like Billy Bankston were, were – they had and they were discussing back in the 60s. Uh, These are artists that before they became very famous were actually 
really, really interested in this whole idea of like California culture. And for me, so what I'm doing is almost a contemporary younger version, I think, of what they did back in the 60s. Um, I remember I had a chance to meet Ed Ruscha and talk to him about it. And, you know, there's an artist named Billy L. Banks. I think it's Billy Bankston. Yeah. Billy L. Yeah. And I'm, he, for me, he's like, for me, he's like, he was to Ed Ruscha what Bernard Williams is to me. He's like the artist artist. You look him up. You should definitely Wikipedia him. He's still alive and he's still showing, but he's one of those people that like when his, one of his pieces shows up, I am like, I, I'm like a kid at a candy store. It's like, it's like Christmas for me because I know what I'm looking at and I know it's a rare gem to, to see one of his pieces up close in person. Um, but what's more important about his work is is, is their story, is it, what they were influenced by, and like and how they brought it to the forefront. You know, these were the guys that were just like, you know what, we're going to take California cool, and we're going to we're going to be artists, and we're going to make work like this, and we're going to make work that you know isn't purchased at an art store. We're going to make work, you know, from metal shops. We're going to make work that you know we're going to paint our you know we're going to paint our our, um, our surfboards. And we're going to use the same material we use on a surfboard. We're going to use it on a painting. You know, I love this idea of these kind of unorthodox manners. And so for me, working on this custom cultural work and working on this kind of uh, the bicycles and the boats and the cars that are very craft, heavily craft-based, it's actually kind of changed. It's funny because it's actually changed my thinking on how I'm approaching paintings now. And I really like that. I really love the idea that... Um, that I can actually work with these materials that you would never find in an in, a, in an art store. Can you explain how you did that? Nope. It's all automotive. Okay. It's all automotive. No, I mean, you know, everything's hand cut. Everything is, everything is produced in the studio. The drawing is made in the studio. It's applied. And then, you know, there's certain fabrication elements that, um, that right now what we're in the process of doing is because I love, I mean, everything is done here in house. At, at one point I was, I was outsourcing a lot of fabrication and then now I have everything done in house. So now what we're doing is we're, you know, now we, that's why we have a professional paint room. I'm actually building uh, an industrial paint room now that we're probably going to do in the next, like, year. So everything is done here in-house. Like, nothing leaves the studio. Um, so and then the other, we have another body of work that is similar to that, but on these other panels that are done in very, very typical materials that you would buy in an art store. And these paintings, I'll show you images on the computer, those are very heavily influenced with, by pinstriping. Something, it's a lost art form that, they do on the side of trucks still. Um, you still find them in hot rods and lowriders motorcycles. and motorcycles. But I'm really, really interested in this whole idea of this kind of lost art form that you don't really see. And it doesn't kind of get the respect that it deserves. I basically take it, and it's almost like pinstriping on steroids. And, and I make it very delicate. I make it very hand embellished. So a lot of the, a lot of the new paintings that I'm making are actually heavily influenced from this culture. So I have two bodies of work right now that I'm working on, or three bodies. I have the sculptural work. I have the, auto, the, the, the paintings done that are strictly completely done in, uh, uh, with automotive, industrial, and, uh, and, yeah, and unorth basic and un unorthodox to, uh, uh, material. And then I have very, you know, very straightforward you know, studio work that is still heavily influenced by this outside custom culture. Sure. No, I mean, you know, to be honest, like, you know, listen, man, the reality is that, like, sometimes you can sell work, sometimes you can't. And right now the economy is not doing very good. So to be quite honest, I kind of do the opposite sometimes. So if I know that... Like, I went to the Armory last week, and it was horrible. It was terrible. Absolutely terrible. The, the independent fair was, was... The independent fair is fantastic. Is this why it's Armory? Both. Um, everybody at the Armory basically brought every tchotchke that they had in the gallery to sell. 
It was you walked by and there was there wasn't a piece that was like no larger than like four by four feet because everyone's looking to to make money. They're looking to sell. and th the thing is this is and this is also the point that I'm trying to make is that you know you can keep true to your work, but there's also a reality to it that you know people get sucked into and like you know so when you see a, a piece that's you know a little bit larger than what you can actually sell it for, there's something very impressive about that. You know, but I'm also not an idiot. Like, I know, I know that I get commissions for, like, smaller work, and I have to make them because, you know, it's, you know, I still, I'm able to still sell the work, but I'm also, um, you know, I also have to realize that, um, you know, I have a studio to maintain, but I'm not watering down my language. I'm, I'm at, you know, a lot of the paintings, in fact, a lot of the new pieces that I'm producing have been sold before they're made just because um, I also, I'm not a factory. I don't. I don't produce I don't produce a high volume of work in my studio. And that's another thing that we can kind of get into at a later time, but it's really important that when you make the work that it's done with like precision and care and there's a lot of, you know, you have to see that the hand is in it and that there's some love put behind it. Um, so that's really really important for me that uh, you know, and especially like with something that's very very new to me is that two of my works just went up um, they went up, um, they're at auction this week you know it's weird some artists would love to be part of that whole thing collectors sugarcoat it and they say it's really good for the artist's career and it's bullshit it's it's just not so they make money from it's not even about that it's just a very it's just a very scandalous part of the art world and it's one of those things that you know and I have two works that are up at a very, very like prestigious and very well-known auction, and in a really big auction house. Uh, you know, some people think that it like validates you as an artist that you're, you know, that people are trading your work on the secondary market. And so now it actually has made me even more kind of defensive, and has even kind of made me realize that I don't want to create a high volume of work anymore. Because just of that, because, and not to mention that the person who put him up for auction actually was a, was used to be a friend of mine. So you know, it was one of those things where like it wasn't even a collector that bought it and is reselling it. This is somebody who I like I traded artwork with, and they're cashing in on, you know, the recent publicity of my work or the value of my work. You know, so it's made me really defensive, and it makes it's made it's actually made me very cautious on like. Who I do business with now, who I sell work to, and how it's and how that's uh, how that's traded on the market. So, um, and again, but it also goes back. But I think it's also a very healthy thing that you know we're not we're not putting a big volume out. I mean, I have a show opening up in Luxembourg next week, and I think we made four. Is it four paintings? Yeah, four paintings and one sculpture, and that's it. But those those four paintings and one sculpture took us a long time to make. With a lot of money, <laughs> with a lot of money per capita, my friend. <laughs> yep, yeah. I th um, no, no, that's not it. We sent it off already. So, should we go look at some images, some slides? Sure. Yep. Okay, so the thing, yeah, now kiss it. So some people have a hard time uh, with this idea that you have assistance, but the rea the reality is this: is that I don't care if you're just starting out. I don't care if you're a student. I don't care if you're the busiest person in the world. As soon as you cross that threshold of the demand to to fulfill an obligation to make work for certain shows, you physically cannot do it by yourself. And what was that for you? Like, what was the moment where you like, oh my God, I need my friend, and like, come Um, you know what? I never, well, first of all, I never, like, really said, like, you know, I need my friends to come help me. For me, again, it's a business, and, like, whenever you step in the studio and you're working on a, on a you're working in the studio and you're working at work, I have a contract involved. And that's another... Huh? Yeah. I mean, so the thing is for me is that even before you even begin, one of the most important things is that I've had the same accountant for 20 years, 
He's not my buddy. We don't hang out. He's just my accountant. And he gets the job done. And he treats my business as a business, like I was making cardboard boxes, which is a good thing or could be a bad thing. Sometimes I'm just like, Judd, I'm an artist, man. Like, you've got to give me some leeway. Like, you know, I'm not making cardboard boxes. But I need you to structure my business on it like I'm making cardboard boxes. You know, so it's a catch-22. Um, I have a very good lawyer as well. You know, like, I have his number on speed dial if I need it. So I do everything with a contract. Everything is written. It's clear. There's no confusion. You know, especially... Do you have assistants? Do you do? Do you have a contract for your assistants? All my assistants that work here. Uh, some people, some people who I thought would play a bigger role, sometimes don't. Some people who don't, sometimes do. Um, you know, there's some people who who started in the studio recently that you know have become a really important asset to the studio just because they're so dynamic and like they can they they can they can multitask and it's really really important and it's those things that you know are really important. But there's also a fluidity to everything. Um, so especially especially that. You know, and also in the in this business, whenever you meet somebody that, in the you know whether it's a gallery or a collector, you know some of them do become your friends. Uh, but you have to know that you know when it's business, it's business. When it's you know friendship time, it's friendship time. And I think you have to kind of maintain that balance, and you have to really kind of be very clear and honest and open about that interaction. Um, so, but for me, it's really tough. I mean, there's some pieces that I don't even touch. I mean, there's some pieces that I've, you know, I was in New York last week and, you know, I had to be there because I'm, you know, I had to be there for business and, but we still had a show to finish up and we had to send it out uh, yesterday. And literally I can show you like my cell phone, like a hundred images of phone images, like text images of, of, of paintings that I got like every 45 minutes and I'm just like no that doesn't look right let's do this or it's like you know we'll do like a Skype video chat and we'll do like a walkthrough and literally like it's like I mean we're but we're working as a team so you know I'm trusting them to really really I'm trusting them with getting the idea across but that takes time to build you know so you can't just do it with anyone but you know, there definitely, you know, there definitely was a point in my career, and I think I, I don't even know how far back because it was, to be honest, it was so organic the way that it happened. Like the transition of having assistance was so organic for me. Um, you know, but then it's tough because, like, you know, with like recognition and like working on certain things, you know, people get the wrong idea about you too. Like, you know, they think that. You know, right away there's like rumors of like, oh, like you know, he doesn't even do anything. He doesn't even he doesn't even touch the work, or you know, oh, he's just so caught up in you know his own thing that you know he doesn't have time to do this or do this with anybody else. And it's like that kind of shit. You can't listen to anybody. Like you gotta like you gotta focus and like you gotta keep like you know you gotta keep your train on schedule and you gotta keep looking forward and that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, I mean, people had people have had assistants. You know, Rembrandt had, you know, half a dozen assistants. It ju it's just part of the process. And if you're, work and if you're successful, it's going to happen to you as well. And, you know, and even if you aren't successful, you know, no, seriously, no, even if you aren't, like, you still need help. You know what I mean? Like, you still need help, like, carrying something. You still need help to, like, to do something. You, you, need, you need help doing something. It's always there. Um, it's just a matter of how you use it. You know what I mean? But, you know, at the same time, like, I am always constantly, like, you know, like, this is a whole folder here of just inspiration and ideas. You know, I'm constantly, so, I don't know, really, but I, I think, like, back, like, people say, like, back in the day, like, you would grab magazines and you cut little, I mean, I think a lot of painters still probably do that, right? You cut out magazines and, like, you save images and you put them in a folder. Well, I don't do that shit anymore. My thing is, like, the internet. <laughs> my iPhone. It's like I take complete advantage of everything. Um, there's a painting right behind you. Sorry. There's a. Uh, I take complete advantage of technology and what I have. I always do. Like that whole thing. Like all that shit. Like that happened. Like back in the '70s. That's back in the '70s. You know, the whole idea of being the starving artist and you know playing that cliche role and you know. 
I can't have a business. That went out for me in the 80s. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm, I'm definitely on a different program. Um, so what do you do with the copyright image? Uh, the copyright image? No, well, I mean, it's, it's just, they're just influences. So I'm not, cop I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm not copying the images. Um, some artists do, though, and they get in trouble for that. I mean, that's just, I mean, obviously, you know, you've seen the laws, like especially with Shepard Ferry copying the Obama poster. I mean, that was a big dilemma. And I know that, you know, I know that he's gone through like a lot of like like just huge like headache with that whole thing. And um, no, I think they resolved it. I think they're I think they're kind of like done with it. So you just use it as an inspiration. Yeah, I just like if I see something, there's a lot of time. I mean, literally, I'll take a photo, but I'll just like I'll look at this one little corner piece of something that was made, and I want to know how it was made. I want to reproduce it that way, and that's really important for me. Um, hold on a second. There is. You know, and recently I've been also doing uh, some video work. Um, there is, let me see if this is the, oh, here we go. I think this might be the book. When did you adopt the name design? Oh, that was like, you know, design is an om de plume. It's, you know, it was, it started off when I decided, when I got really interested in, um, in street culture and, you know, the whole idea of, like, graffiti and painting on the street. That was a big, that was, you know, I mean, I've known, I've known Eric, you know, Eric was part of that whole scene as well, like, way back in the day. Yeah, it was my tag name, but then I got my name officially changed, like, my middle name, yeah, when I was in my early 20s. My mom wasn't too happy, but. <laughs> it's Carlos Design Roland. Um. You know, because for me, it just it, it just kind of became part of my identity. It's just part of like who I am. But uh, believe it or not, like even like right now, like most you know most people who I do business with either call me D or they call me Carlos. It doesn't doesn't really matter. I mean, I'm not I'm not that caught up in um, I'm not that caught up in you know what the name is about. Um, I'm more I'm more I'm more interested in in the work. And I'm more interested in, in, in how the, the, the work has uh, – and what, I, what I'm actually really happy about, too, is that, you know, people in the art world are more interested in, in, in the, the final work than anything else. Uh, it used to be part of, like, you know, it used to be, like, these stories about, like, my history and, you know, you have this. And, you know, I, I mean, I think any artist gets that. They, people are inter more interested in your personal history than they are about the work. And so me, I kind of put that I, – I basically, like, put that on lockdown. I don't talk about that anymore. I just talk about the work. Um, hold on a second. I'm sorry. I'm just looking for this, this, this book thing here. Oh, here we go. I think this might be – Uh, okay. Uh, the new book is like 250 pages. This is going to be, um, this is coming out next month. This is, um, this is produced by Gestalt and it's a German publisher. So this is going to be my first, uh, my first artist, uh, monograph and, uh, Morgan Spurlock, who's a filmmaker to the forward. I, there's quotes by Shepard Ferry. There's quotes by Erwin Worm, who's one of my all time favorite contemporary artists. Um, or one worm, and then there's also the two directors of two different museums and institutions. I think I even have yeah. There's a quote from Lance Armstrong in here. So it kind of it it, it actually it's like this whole like thing of it's it's a very it's a very pop culture book. I didn't you know I didn't want to make I didn't want to make this very serious uh, book that I mean I, you know I'm only 40 years old. I mean that you know that stuff can wait until you know a catalog resonates until Paul's age and like and you know. The catalog resume can wait. So, but basically, this is going to give you a very good kind of like overview. And I got to tell you, like, you know, I grew up on 38th Street in California, and like a lot of people that are on the right hand page, like, those look like a lot of guys that I grew up with. And now I'm like working with them. You know, so the thing is, like, that kind of stuff, like, I can relate to that. I mean, I can relate to that on a professional and personal level. Um, and this is kind of, you know, again, gives like a whole overview of my work. Um, you guys are welcome to stop me and ask any questions because I'm just going to go through these. Uh, Jeffrey Deitch actually owns that. Um, yeah. And so, <laughs> which is really funny. Yeah, the, 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 the car is called Pimp Juice. And like Jeffrey Deitch, who's now the, the director of, of LA Mocha, owns the, uh, huh? He totally does. Yeah, he, he's actually had a, he actually had a full-time driver in that car. 
I love. Oh, I wish it was darker, but you can see the little girl, the, the girl with her ass up, says pimp juice. Yeah. You know, and then you get like these, then you get these mandala paintings. It's like it's this whole idea of like oil and water, you know. But again, if you look at both of them, they seamlessly work together. There's something very seamless and very spiritual about both aspects of the work. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, in fact, in fact, at my show, and I'll show you another photo. That this that mandala piece was literally right in front of that car. Hi, Mumu. Uh, this is a piece that just got uh, picked up by the museum, the Contemporary Museum in San Diego, and this is a um, this was a custom lowrider rickshaw. And I like the idea. So I had so the audio on it has like uh, has this very wonderful uh, vintage Pakistani uh, music with you know very very cliche uh, lowrider aesthetics. Um, and I had this because uh, in San Diego there's a big community of um, of a lot of outdoor transportation. So I wanted this to kind of have this relationship with the city, but also with the with the uh, you know with the the population of immigrants that were there, and that really meant a lot to me to kind of uh, again to put these two worlds together that normally wouldn't wouldn't mix. These are details of the of that piece that I just showed you. And most of that's like twenty four karat gold plating, all hand engraved. Uh, yeah, those are car tires. Those are actually those are white wall lowrider tires. And then this is a little chandelier that's inside. This is from a show in Spain. Um, you know, and again, I mean, I like the idea of the aesthetic and how like the cult, you know the sculptural pieces work with the paintings. Uh, this is a piece that I just did for the Korea uh, for the Biennial in South Korea, and this was. Uh, Obviously, it's a Buddha sitting on top of these uh, car speakers, these trunk speakers, and it's called "Sitting on Chrome." And it was taken from it's taken from this rap song this guy named Master Ace did called "Sitting on Chrome." Like I used to listen to that song over and over and over and over again when I was in my studio, like in my, my my late teens. Uh, so I I really kind of I didn't base it directly on that song, but I gave it the title from that song. But this piece has a flawless track that I actually made myself in um, GarageBand. And it's a mixture of Philip Glass and Wu-Tang Clan. So you get this really beautiful classical music, and then it goes into this Wu-Tang Clan track, and then it goes back into Philip Glass, and it goes back out to Wu-Tang Clan. No, stuff like that I just hijacked. Um, and these are just details. Uh, this is a commission in uh, Netherlands. Uh, and this is actually all on wood, too. These are all wood panels. And you can see it, you see it right there to the right. There's like 20 people painting it. That's all me, all 20 of them. <laughs> 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 is this the same piece as the one that was scheduled? Uh, it's, it's, it's the same, the, the same, yeah, the same. You know, actually, thanks, man. You know, believe it or not, that there's actually, all of this body of work actually came from one painting. Like, if I show you the original painting, you can actually follow that painting in about, like, 20 other pieces. The same motifs, the same ideas, the same direction. And I think that's another problem that artists have. Like, they think that everything they do has to be absolutely new. And you basically drive yourself crazy trying to create the newness, which you fall flat on your face because you're trying so hard. And when you look at the work, you can tell. So the thing is, like, if you know that if something's not broken, don't fix it. Just go with the flow and, like, actually capitalize on that and build on top of that. The Buddha actually sat in front of this piece, which was uh, this was a piece based after it was based on the artist Yoyo Kasama, um, who actually did an exhibition at the uh, 
uh, at the Bass the Bass Museum, and this is where my show was. So there's almost like a homage to her, but she also she's the one who did the Infinite Room. You ever seen those where you walk into the room and she did these walls where you completely you can walk in and everything looks completely. There are rooms that are about the size of this here, and you walk in and it looks completely infinite. And they're absolutely stunning. Um, so this is this idea of like repetition and spirituality that you know the 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 Buddha was basically facing this piece and they had this really good kind of conversation and language with each other. So when you when you peek your head in, this is what you saw, and it was just it just went on. It was infinite. Yeah, that's actually and I and uh, again a lot of the early pieces were actually made. They were actually made in auto body shops. I mean, everything was made in auto body shops. So you would go there and work with the auto body people and do it together for uh, Kind of. I mean, you know, it depends. Like some of the some of the first, you know, some of the first layouts I would do myself. Like this is what I was telling you about. See, this is where, this is the bicycles and the sculptures and the boats that are in front of the paintings. It was the boat that was in Venice. That's a, that's, that's a good point. I, the whole idea of lowrider culture is you, is you take something and you keep adding or you change it. That's the whole idea of this custom culture. It's about making the work new again. So I actually took the boat from Venice and I put about 35000 of my own money into it and I made that piece again, new. And that one's actually still in storage. And there's the car in front of the paintings. Like the... No, one boat, but I changed it. It used to be blue, and then I changed it to that. Yeah, I know it's got better sound system now. Uh, you know, even 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 the hydraulics are a work of art. I mean, the hydraulics are all gold plated. Um, those are all custom made. Uh, Long Island City, yeah. This is uh yeah I am. This is uh this is uh the recent project that I did. I went to the island of Curaçao and I worked with these kids. Um they make these uh these amazing bicycles that they extend the back of the the bicycle. So I went back and forth for about a year and this is the first time that I've ever introduced a photography into my language. So huh? Yeah. Yeah. So I shot all of these. I also I also produced the two minute video, and what I did is I made over the course. I initially went there for a small project, and I absolutely then I found these kids, and I absolutely fell in love with what they were doing. I went back for over the course of a year, and these kids make these bicycles. What they do is they chop the back of the bicycles off, and then they make them long. And what they do is they it's called zwebar. And what they do is they go to the top of these mountains. They catch a piece of metal and they just slide down the mountains. I'll show you guys the video in a little bit, but it's a really, really un, it's a, it's I've never seen anything like it before, and uh, these are some of the kids that that I, that I was with. What do you mean, like a piece of metal on the concrete? Yeah, it's um, like it's almost like skiing. Like yeah, it's almost like skiing or skiing. Um, on the, yeah, the back of the, the wheel on the back, and they, slide, and they slide down the mountain. It's, and it's really dangerous, and a lot of kids have gotten killed. So the government has outlawed these bicycles. So that bicycle I actually had initially made on the black market, and then I had it shut, and then I had it FedEx to my studio, and that's when I embellished it. Where's Curacao? Curacao is part of the ABC Islands. It's in um, it's just south of Venice, no, north of Venezuela, south of uh, you know uh, Cuba and. Jamaica. Um, and again, this is uh, and this is going back into the work. I'll show you guys the video in a second. This is the initial boat that I did. This, these are process images. So you see, like, there's a DJ booth, and you know, it's floating on the water to the left. The left is where he's in Italy. Uh, this is also part of uh, the 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 body of work, the show. And this is, it says "Say Swell," which means um, "Hey, brother." This is a bicycle sculpture that I produced for Lance Armstrong to raise money for the Livestrong Foundation. Yeah. 
and actually really, really normal and nice person too. This is uh, from my. I know. Isn't that strange? This is uh, my first. Uh, this is probably my first big museum show. This is at the Contemporary Museum in St. Louis. Uh, this is from the Bass Museum, and this chandelier is appropriated. It's made from with like um, vintage crystals, uh, appropriated chandeliers, and then I put rear view mirrors, and the whole thing runs on a sound system off of a car radio. Uh, this is a piece with, that has a video. And I found all this old Super 8 film in my father's attic. And so I, what I did is I got the... Um, this, is a, this is another video that I made. I've only made like three video pieces. But the, uh, the video is this wonderful film that basically kind of talks about the idea. And I've been doing these, 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 these bicycle sculptures called... Um, uh, they're called ghost bikes. And you can see them on the streets, like on the corners where people have been killed and I, I like the idea of this idea of like memorial and it's a really 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 like believe it or not I think that these 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 for me are probably the most important pieces that I've made because they're so personal and the thing is again when when you start you know when you take a painting like that that's on the wall you know superficially it's good it's visually okay it's 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 a it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to look at but when you get into this realm of work and it's so personal, and it's so touching, and it's so raw and honest. People can see that, and they can feel that. And I think that is, and this is, and and just you know, again, I still make both. I make, I make. So what what I've done is, I think I've been able to capture that idea of making something visually stunning, and put it onto something that actually has a story and a discussion. If that makes any sense at all, and I think that's been that's been a really really important uh, turning point I think in my life and in my career. Um, so you know I mean and you know I just I made another ghost bike um, just recently, uh, but I'll, I'll show I'll try to show you guys this film. Is that one's a memorial to your dad? This is a memorial actually to my family, and it's a and the, the whole idea it's it's about the idea is about um, is is a is. A, is the whole idea is about um, memorial, but also it's in a beautiful way, though. It's, it's, a, it's about thinking about things that I can't have anymore, that I wish that I can have again, but I can't have them. Like, it's, it's past. It's done. Like, this, like today, this moment will never happen again. And there's some moments that you wish that you can have again, but you can't. There's, I, have so many, I, have so many, I have so many good memories as a child that I wish that I can have those memories back again. And those are the things I think that make me a little bit more humble than usual. And so when I made this film, like literally, like this film almost, almost like brought me to tears when I made it because it just, it's, it's with my, it has my family in it. And when you look at it, it's, it's such a, and even the quality of the film is so grainy that even though it has Spanish music and it's about my family, the quality of the film can translate into any culture. It just it just has a really, really good quality to it. These are some new pieces that I'm doing as well, these hand-embroidered pieces. Uh, these are kind of based on uh, these cloth pieces that you would find in, you know, a lot of Spanish households. Um, these are covered in 24-karat gold leaf. Um, I'm doing a GSA project, which is the government, um, the Arts and Architecture Program. So I'm going to do these in a really large scale for the new the new FBI building in uh, in Puerto Rico. I wish they'd take a thug sign though instead. <laughs> be awesome. <laughs> be, and that would be perfect for the FBI building too. Um, so let me just kind of just whiz through these. And these are great. Like even when I saw this guy on the left hand side, I didn't even know who he was, but he was so handsome. And he was so striking. There was something really about him that I was just like, wow. It's like, for me, he was just a work of art when I saw him. There was something really striking about him. This is Danny, who's worked on a few pieces for me. Uh, I just, I love the, and I love the, I love the community aspect of these guys. I love the ass shot. I got that when I was in Vegas for the Super Show. And like the nail, the nail shot I got in Puerto Rico. 
This girl was a total sweetheart on the left-hand side. She was so, so sweet. She was just there hanging out by herself, just checking out the show. She, like, came in from Texas, just there for the weekend. Um, my engraver, that's his son. That's on the bottom, right-hand side. Uh, this is a piece that I did on Benji Melendez. Benji Melendez started one of the first gangs in, um, in New York called the Ghetto Brothers. This is a piece that I did for the Brooklyn Museum, and it just kind of just talked about this whole uh, – This uh, I, I actually made a 14-minute film based on Benji. Um, I would show it to you guys today, but I think it's just easier if you guys just go to my website and just look, and just watch it in the, in the comfort of your own home. It's a really, really good movie, though. It's it's a fantastic movie. It's 14 minutes long, and there's a – it it's a, Isn't it? It's a great surprise ending. Like, people – like, I showed it – no, no, surprise ending. Like, even when you see it, you're just going to be like, oh, shit. That is so on the money. And a lot of it actually, it, I, I can completely relate to a lot of it, but you have to see the film. So, so on this bike, is it full length film? 14 minute film. Oh, 14 yeah. Yeah, this is the uh, the mosaic oh, for the. Uh, yeah. That's uh, here in Chicago. It's at the Sedgwick Station. This is a permanent installation at the Bass Museum in Miami. Sedgwick Station, which line? Brown line? Yeah, on North Avenue. This is the new ghost bike that I did, that I produced. Yeah, this one I, I've, has never even been. This one actually went directly to a collector. This one, this has never even been on. Has never been shown. And I have, you know, again, my influences from, you know, where I got the, the idea for the ghost bikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is, and that's the book. So that kind of gives you a really good overview of everything. Questions? Yep. Um, some of them are freehand, some of them are masked. Yeah, you know, I mean, I. Some of them are touched up after the after they're masked. Yeah, I mean, I gotta tell you, I mean, I, I literally, I mean, I, I, I utilize, I utilize whatever tools I can use. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't go into this philosophy of like this is cheating, that's not cheating. That shit is for amateurs. It's good for the puddings and the eating. Yes. It is like no seriously like you get that from as, you know you know it's so funny like and I get that mostly from like young art students they're just like you're cheating like that's cheating it's like wow it's like when you get out of school and like mommy and daddy stop paying for school and your bills and you start making art then we can sit down and have a conversation but that whole thing is just like yeah that for me it's just for amateurs um, let me show you this is the, the the bicycle film I wanted to show you guys really oh wait sorry that wasn't it. Um, Yeah. No, um in Curtis, yeah. The ghost bike one, when I walked in that room and I got that that Oh the one oh in Miami. Oh that's right, you're out there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even 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 uh, honestly, like I've seen it I've seen it I've seen it a dozen times more than that and I still get the same effect. Oh, Vernissage TV. Yeah, yeah, the Hector Laveau song, yeah, which is a great song, which, again, which I totally hijacked that song as well. Uh, so let's see if I can actually get this on here.